we have uh, two talks together. Uh, it's a series of uh, a talk by Dr. Karakas and also Dr. Majnik. Dr. Majnik will be speaking first and they will be talking regarding the neuromodulation in pediatric epilepsy. Uh, Dr. Majnik is our pediatric neurosurgeon um, at Northern Children's Hospital. And uh, he completed his medical school from University of Michigan and finished his neurosurgery training at University of Louisville. He also did a fellowship at uh, Cincinnati Children's. He is currently the surgical director of pediatric restorative neuroscience practice at Norton Children's Hospital. Dr. Mushnik has several research and humanitarian interest. He regularly provides free pediatric neurosurgical care to children in West Bank and Gaza. And he also is developing research protocols to understand how children deal with uh, and recover from trauma. Uh, his talk will be followed by Dr. Caracas. Dr. Caracas is uh, our pediatric epileptologist at uh, Norton Children's Neuroscience Institute. He finished his child neurology training at Sunny Downstate, and that was followed by two fellowships, one in clinical neurophysiology and uh, epilepsy fellowship at Texas Children's Hospital uh, and Baylor College of Medicine. He's been with us for the last 12 months, and his special interests include surgical epilepsy, management of medically refractory uh, pediatric epilepsy, and neurostimulation. Um, uh, I will invite Dr. Majnik to uh, start his presentation. Thanks, Pradeep. Uh, so I'm going to sort of introduce uh, what Dr. Caracas is going to talk about, uh, which is a focus on uh, responsive neurostimulation and just talk a little bit about how the modulation of epileptic um, problems can be very helpful. Um, and it's sort of bound up with the history of epilepsy a little bit. And uh, let's see here. Not sure how to progress my slide. Pretty. How do I? Um, there we go. Um, I certainly have no conflicts of interest regarding what I'm going to present today. Um, there are 4.7 per thousand children with epilepsy in the U.S., about 470,000. Um, medical management is certainly the first line, usually, um, but about 30, 35% have uh, drug-resistant epilepsy, which is the failure to achieve seizure freedom despite two appropriately trialed anti-epileptic medications. Um, this is a relatively recent change in the paradigm of how we treat epilepsy. Um, and so we're still coming up and there's a flourishing um, research effort to describe how we might handle these best from a surgical point of view. Um, neuromodulation, um, is alteration of nerve activity through targeted, a second here, there we go. Um, Target delivery of a stimulus such as electrical stimulation. You can use chemical agents, certainly like a baclofen pump, um, to specific neurological sites in the body. Uh, there are three main types of neuromodulation currently for epilepsy. One's responsive neurostimulation. Uh, there's vagal nerve stimulation. There's deep brain stimulation. Uh, there are some other modalities that are far less common. Um, often you'll hear about open and closed loop neuromodulation. Um, and uh, closed loop, uh, means that stimulation is provided in response to the detection of seizure activity. Uh, in the case of RNS, it's direct EG seizure activity detection with the electrodes that are in place. Um, with some models of VNS, there is tachycardia detection, which is uh, seizure activity often, um, and those models will deliver a stimulation in response to that. And then there's open loop, which is just a pre-programmed electrical stimulation uh, to specific brain or other structures uh, thought to be implicated in seizures. Most VNS models uh, without tachycardia are open loop, uh, and DBS is open loop currently. Um, here's just a, an algorithm for how we approach uh, epileptic patients. Um, you know, if you get good control with medications with an acceptable side effect profile, you're good. Uh, those 30 to 35% who don't um, are drug resistant and enter um, an evaluative phase, a phase one, a phase two, um, including video EEG, uh, magnetoencephalogram, stereo 
EEG, you know, any number of things. Um, if, if that phase one and two evaluation um, reveals sort of a generalized seizure, um, the options are a corpus callosotomy, a VNS, um, a DBS. Um, I think RNS can be used, but I think that's less frequent. Um, for focal epilepsy, you can consider resection, you can consider disconnection. In cases where the epilepsy localizes to eloquent cortex and the costs in terms of functionality are too high, uh, then RNS is a, 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 an increasingly popular option for that. Um, VNS can also be used for focal epilepsy, although that's less common. So the history of epilepsy is kind of interesting in how it has changed its paradigm for the longest time, uh, certainly as far back as 3,000 years ago in this text from Babylon. Um, it was thought to be a spiritual disease, sort of one of the, tr in the translation of this tablet, the first line reads, if epilepsy falls once upon a person or falls many times, it is as the result of possession by a demon or a departed spirit. So, so really all epilepsy treatment was spiritual. They, they brought in the priest, they prayed for them. And this is definitely a, a paradigm that still exists today. Um, this is a, a pretty good book. If you haven't read it, um, the spirit catches you and falls down to Leah Lee, um, and uh, she was born in 1982, had Lennox Gastot, and her Hmong parents felt that this epilepsy was evidence that she was spiritually gifted, and they did not want to modulate that. They did not want to treat that. Um, the physicians and parents ended up uh, conflicting, and, uh, and the medical establishment removed her from her parents' care. Um, sadly, after a seizure at age four years, she entered a coma from which she never emerged and died at age 30. Um, Hippocrates, so, so it, it was not the case that s spiritual explanations for this were the only ones out there. Uh, about at the same time as the Babylonian text, um, 5th century BCE, Hippocrates was writing about how he did not believe the sacred disease, which is what he called epilepsy, was any more divine than another disease, and he felt that the brain was the seat of the disease, uh, as it is of other very violent diseases. Sadly, pretty much everyone thought he was just being silly, they ignored him, uh, and it wasn't until the 17th century that the spiritual etiology uh, hypothesized etiology for seizures and epilepsy began to shift to more of a neurologic basis. Um, and so Willis um, in the 1700s said, the morbific matter flowing in the heads of the nerves produces diverse kinds of convulsions according to their various plenty and dispensation. You know, the interesting thing here is they weren't sure what kind of morbific matter was flowing to the nerves. Um, and so for a couple of centuries, um, because of the observed facial flushing and bounding carotid and cranial pulses during seizures, they thought the morbific matter flowing into the head was, uh, was an excess of blood. Um, and so uh, seizures were attributed to excessive cerebral blood flow. And so lots of doctors experimented with manual compression of the carotid arteries as a means of decreasing cerebral blood flow and avoiding seizures. Um, Caleb Hillier Perry delivered a case report to the Medical Society in London in 1789. And basically until the late 19th century, manual carotid compression was part of the treatment for epilepsy, which I guess you could consider some kind of modulation. Uh, James Leonard Corning is the most famous for this. Um, his his uh, hypothesized pathophysiology for seizures was one, the arrangement in the cerebral vasomotor mechanism culminating in anemia, two, unconsciousness caused by excessive cerebral anemia and convulsions caused by the irritative effects of the anemia on the cortex, and three, anemia succeeded by venous engorgement caused by the spasm in the cervical muscles and consequent prolongation of the convulsion. So he thought also that carotid compression could abort this process, and he developed tools for this. So he developed something called the carotid fork, uh, and which was the abortifacent, and he developed something called the carotid truss, and apparently there was some amount of literature on how to tighten it just enough, but not too much, uh, to uh, help prevent seizures. It wasn't until uh, the early 1900s that the idea that the morbific overflow was not blood, but instead electricity, didn't really start to take hold um, again until the early 1900s. Uh, Hans Berger started, it created electrographic recordings of the human brain activity. He was a very meticulous 
scientist. And so his series of papers starting in 1929 started to shift the tides and, and it became clearer and clearer that, that epilepsy was a, a, a disease of um, electrical overflow rather than um, um, blood overflow. Um, and when William Lennox delivered um, his 1935 talk to the Neurologic Congress in London, that pretty much laid to rest the widely believed vascular theories of epilepsy. It was now an electrical disease. Um, interestingly, even prior to this shift in the hypothesis for where seizures came from, um, they had started adding electricity to the carotid fork. And here you can see a diagram of this. Um, so they were, they were hoping that and it's interesting because they, they weren't they did not conceive of themselves as modulating the electrical activity they thought by stimulating the vagal nerve you would slow the heart rate and decrease cardiac output and therefore add to the restricted blood flow to the brain in order to help it recover from a, a seizure um, so this is actually the first vagal nerve stimulator um, and it was the carotid truss with uh, with an electrical current added. Um, you can some details is positioned below the level of the upper border of the thyroid cartilage and secured with a band around the neck. Um, and despite the initial claims of dramatic benefit, I think not a surprise to any of us, Corning's treatments did not produce consistent positive results and these were abandoned late in the 1900s. I'm sorry, in the late 1800s. Uh, so even with all this potential material for the discovery of the electrical modification modulation of the vagus nerve, uh, it really wasn't until um, this abstract um, that, um, that, that people really started to take a, a good look at um, vagus nerve stimulation for epilepsy. Um, there were some studies in rodents, primates, and dogs in the 80s that showed efficacy, and then Wake Forest partnered with Cybronics and implanted the first two vagal nerve stimulators in November 88 and March 89. Uh, the, both of them had, both these patients had frequent complex partial seizures for greater than eight years, and after 28 weeks of implantation, there was a 71% seizure reduction uh, versus each patient's pre-implant baseline frequency. Uh, in 93, um, um, there, there's two single blind pilot studies um, that involve 14 patients uh, that found the mean reduction in seizure frequency after 14 to 35 months of VNS was about 50%. Um, five of these 14 patients had 50% or greater reduction, and two of them had been seizure free for over a year. Uh, and the adverse events were um, relatively mild. So currently the indications for vagal nerve stimulations, intractable focal epilepsy, focal to bilateral tonic clonic epilepsy, generalized onset epilepsy, Lennox Gastaut, Rett's um, epilepsy rated to comorbidities such as encephalopathy, hypothalamic hematoma, and tuberous sclerosis. Uh, and you know, sometimes it's just, wow, this is a terrible situation. We don't have many other options. Um, VNS implantation, um, you know, is wrapped around the vagus nerve um, in the Upper right here is the vagus nerve with the electrodes wrapped around it. There, um, there are three. Um, one is a one is a ground, and then two electrodes. Um, this is actually the passer we use to go from the incision here to the incision down here. Um, in about 2015, uh, a research group out of Israel started to publish some data that said if you um, make the incision here in the um, traditional region, you're a lot closer to the laryngeal nerves and therefore your uh, risk of um, complications or uh, side effects due to vagal nerve stimulation were higher. Uh, and they advocated for coming just above the uh, clavicle. So um, I migrated my incision here to, my, to an incision here. Um, and uh, in 17, they documented some of their findings and they found that hoarseness went from 28 to 4%. Vocal cord palsy from 5.6 to zero, bradycardia and asystole from about 12% to zero, dyspnea from between 4 and 25% to 1.4, uh, and headache and paresthesias from 12% to zero. Um, and they found that um, many patients, 32.4%, um, were able to re achieve a maximum stimulation on the VNS. The VNS was able to be turned all the way up, and they found no laryngeal side effects. Um, with the implantation of vagal nerve stimulation, it became clear that we were not just sort of a, it became clear that the effects of putting a vagal nerve stimulator on were widespread. 
um, and that and that and that this was one node of a complicated network that um, was successfully modifying uh, seizures, um, even though we really didn't know how. And so what you're looking at here is um, a medium nerve uh, uh, somatosensory evoke potential. So you zap them at the median nerve and that information travels up into the cervical plexus, into the brainstem, and then up here into the cranium. And you get these waveforms depending on where you place your, uh, where you place your needles. Um, and in one of the first studies to look at how the nervous system was modulated with vagal nerve stimulation, uh, they looked at um, the time between so if you zap the median nerve, what was the time um, between the wave representing uh, brainstem signal reception and cortical signal reception? And they found that um, there was a statistically significant increase in that latency, that it took a little bit longer for that wave to go between the cervicomedullary and thalamocortical um, nodes. Um, and the strong implication here was that the VNS induces changes elsewhere in the nervous system. It's pretty clear now that not only does VNS provoke changes in the central nervous system, that it may be provoking changes system-wide uh, in the inflammatory response in your gut microbiome. Um, there's lots of interesting research that's sort of spilling out uh, as we really discover what happens when you modulate the, the vagus nerve. This is a paper that um, looked at different network measures and found, so in, in every red node, they found once you had a vagal nerve stimulator, uh, there was a decrease, and in every blue node, they found an increase uh, in these different measures of network connectivity. So um, there's some pretty profound changes and widespread changes that happen just by putting electrodes on the VNS, uh, on the vagus nerve. Uh, so based on this research, based on these studies that we've started to develop a sense of, well, well how is the vagus nerve stimulator modulating epilepsy? And uh, I don't think we're to the point where we understand how it's modulating epilepsy, but we definitely have a better sense of the networks involved um, when we're when we're stimulating the um, vagus nerve, uh, there's a big research group out of uh, Toronto that's looking at this, um, and and basically advances in brain imaging and computational tools have a large large scale mapping of neural networks, and the current model of the network involved in VNS therapeutics is represented in this picture. Similarly, with DBS we're starting to understand that the epileptic circuits involved um, make it amenable, make that particular, you know, those particular kinds of epilepsy that are amenable to deep brain stimulation, that you're basically modulating one little node in this complicated network, and it's having this profound uh, effect. And so, you know, as we've sort of pushed ourselves into this network understanding of epilepsy, you know, we see a real change in paradigm. What started with spirits moved to blood flow, which moved to an electrical storm, which has really moved to a brain network dysfunction. And here's a review article from 2013 that, you know, you know, that stated brain functioning is increasingly seen this complex interplay of dynamic neural systems that rely on the integrity of structural and functional networks. And when those networks fail to regulate themselves, we get seizures and epilepsy. Um, the DBS literature is still pretty early. Um, um, here is one, a multi-center double-blind randomized controlled trial uh, of the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Um, and they looked at 110 adults with medically refractory partial seizures, including secondarily generalized seizures. And by two years, it was a 56% median percent reduction in frequency. Uh, a little over half had a seizure reduction of at least 50% and 14 patients were seizure-free for at least six months. Uh, in children, um, here is a study from 2006 done in Mexico. Um, looked at 13 patients with uh, Lennox Gusteau, um, and they put a uh, they put a deep brain stimulator in the central median thalamic nuclei, um, and the overall seizure reduction was 80 percent. Three patients with no improvability, no improvement in the ability scale score, but two patients were rendered seizure free uh, and are now living a normal life, which is pretty remarkable for Lennox Gusteau. Um, the remaining eight patients experienced progressive improvement from being totally disabled to becoming independent in five cases. So really, uh, it's a great paper. I, I think you know we definitely need more research and more verification but it it certainly offers hope for a situation in which there's not a lot of hope otherwise um, so for uh, dbs and the pediatric crowd it's been most successful with implantations at central median thalamic nucleus with seizure frequency reduction of 30 to 100 percent in 17 of 18 patients implanted 
Um, six pediatric patients who have benefited from BBS placed bilaterally in the anterior thalamic nucleus. I think we're still working out what the relative indications for those nuclei are. Um, in specific situations, um, the DBS is now being implanted the hippocampus, subthalamic nucleus, posteromedial hypothalamus, and mammalothalamic, mammal, mammalothalamic tract. Um, and, and, you know, I think with less data, there appears to be some reason for hope here. So there's more than just thalamic nuclei that can, that can be targets here. Um, I mean, one of the big things is always with the kid, with the kid crowd, um, is that continued brain growth and development with age may cause electrode or wire migration. I think we're still seeing with, you know, not only what happens, but how do you uh, mitigate those risks um, in the developing child? So um, before I turn it over to Dr. Caracas, here's just our current surgical workflow for how we uh, figure out where to put a responsive neurostimulator. This is the 3D model of a patient. The uh, small dots there, the blue and yellow dot, are where the MEG dipoles localize to. Uh, the purple blobs are all areas of uh, uh, PET hypometabolism with a relatively high specificity, not sensitivity. Um, based on sort of these 3D multimodal, um, multimodal uh, models, um, we develop a plan to place uh, SEEG electrodes, so that's the same patient. And here is our plan for um, stereo uh, EEG electrode implantation. Uh, and so he comes in, he, uh, well, sorry about that. We, we take this plan, so that this 3D model allows us to see sort of globally how this plan looks. Do the leads crossed? Are we violating uh, vasculature territories? Uh, you know, it's, it, it provides us with this global view. Uh, and then in order to get these electrodes in, we import all of those trajectories uh, into a computer program and send it off. And they create a 3D printed uh, frame uh, that's ex exceedingly accurate um, that gets mounted to the patient's head. Uh, and through each of these hubs, we get to place a, a, an SEG electrode. And so here are the SEGs placed. Um, once they're placed, the, the patient gets monitored uh, in, the, uh, in the EMU until we can see where the um, uh, seizures are coming from. Um, this is the same patient as earlier. Um, here are the four electrodes that seem to be implicated in his seizures, uh, two on the left and two on the right. And then what we do is we take this information that's, that's very anatomically accurate um, and we place um, and we place our, our nesses. Give me a second. You can see here, if you look carefully, that here are the electrodes. The green are where the um, seizure activity is coming from. And you can see these gray tubes with the little markers. And those are actually um, uh, sort of anatomically accurate models of the actual RNS electrodes. You could see some of them have closer electrode spacing. Some of them have farther electrode spacing. And so this is our plan. So we take this plan and we put it into our stealth station. Um, here the plans go. Um, the patient's, um, you know, secured to the to the to the table and the head clamp. And this is actually uh, the auto guide robot that we use. And and what we do is we you know we swing this around until it's close enough to one of those trajectories. Uh, and then we you know hit a button over here on this console. Uh, and this auto guides itself to the precise trajectory based on the self system. Um, and then we implant the electrodes uh, and uh, do a small craniotomy and take those electrodes and put them into the uh, generator. This is an actual patient. This is an allograft. This is so when we make a fake bone flap, that's what it looks like. Um, but but it, it serves the purpose of showing you, you know, we cut out this chunk of bone and we place this uh, generator in and screw it in place and take these electrodes and uh, and then attach them to the generator that uh, that provides closed loop modulation of of uh, the patient's seizures. Um, any questions? Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, just for, we, we will take the questions in the end when, um, is that okay? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then I would invite Dr. Caracas to uh, start his presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Mashnik. That was a great talk and a great introduction to RNS. So my talk is going to be a little bit about more of specifics of RNS. Um, Karakas, would you mind my... sharing your screen? Yes, I'm trying one second. Okay. All right, so um, my talk is gonna be again RNS for refractory focal epilepsy, and it's a, going to be a bit more about the specifics of RNS and a little bit more uh, technical aspect of this device. 
so I have no disclosures. So just uh, to give you a little bit of understanding uh, about the different epilepsy types. So we categorize epilepsy into two major categories, focal and generalized, uh, as Dr. Shah also mentioned. So focal seizures are those that begin with an electrical discharge in a part of brain and that may stay in the same spot or may just generalize. Or um, generalized epilepsies are those that start uh, all at once with a white uh, spread uh, electrical discharge in both sides of the brain. So that's how it looks like. You know, it just starts uh, in a part of the brain with, with the focal seizures and the generalized epilepsy, they just uh, occur all at once. And the focus will be uh, for the focal seizures and basically for the RNS. So as Dr. Mashnik also mentioned, uh, what is drug resistant epilepsy? It's also known as medically refractory or pharmacal resistance or intractable epilepsy. If you have failed uh, two or more medication um, that have been appropriately chosen with uh, highest or maximum and dose, then you're considered to be refractory, having refractory epilepsy. So in general, uh, in patients with epilepsy, about 50% would uh, be well responsive to only one medication. The another 13% would require the second medication and less than 4% will be well controlled with third additional medication. And then afterward, doesn't matter how many more medication you try, your uh, epilepsy would probably be resistant to any medication. But and unfortunately, about 33% of patients with epilepsy will still uh, have refractory epilepsy. So in general, there are like almost 3.4 million people in US and one third of them, which is almost like 1 million people are still living with the drug resistant epilepsy. Uh, so, and, and looking at how many of those people are really being referred to comprehensive epilepsy center, uh, it seems like it's just one in five patients, which is around maybe 200,000. And only out of those 200,000 patients, only 3,000 patients gets like some sort of uh, surgical intervention. Imagine like, 1 million people with drug resistance epilepsy and only 3,000 people can uh, get some sort of surgery. So uh, epilepsy centers are those places where, the, uh, where they offer a full range of treatment options. Uh, there's like a team of experts, including neurologists, epileptologists, neuroradiologists, psychologists, neurosurgeons, et cetera. And we can do complete evaluation and diagnostic testing with, uh, we can offer extensive medical or different uh, surgical options. Please, if you have someone who has uh, failed two or more medication, make sure that you refer them to comprehensive epilepsy center. Now, in terms of the treatment option for drug resistance epilepsy, there are several, uh, including epilepsy surgery, as Dr. Mashi mentioned, lesionectomy, ablation, maybe ketogenic diet or neuromodulation devices like RNS and DNS. And our talk is going to be a little bit of more of like specific of RNS. So uh, what is RNS? Uh, again, um, it's a uh, first closed loop brain responsive nerve stimulation system. As Dr. Mashnik mentioned, in the open loop system, they just stimulate all the time, regardless of any sort of seizure activity. But when you have a closed loop, what device does is it first monitors the brain activity. It detects any sort of abnormal brain activity as the seizures, and then responsively stimulate uh, for those seizure to stop. So this abnormal uh, activity can be recorded and uploaded into a computer, and you can have some idea about frequency, timing, and allocation of electrographic activity uh, over months, years in a natural state setting using this device, basically. So uh, what it looks like, again, as Dr. Mashini uh, mentioned, it's a device that sits in a tray that's embedded into skull. It usually has a total of four electrodes that can go into the brain, and Two of them would be active, meaning that uh, it would uh, record the brain activity and stimulate responsively. The uh, electrode can be either like a strip electrode that sits on the surface of brain, or it can be a depth electrode that goes into the brain itself to stimulate. And this data can be basically recorded uh, using a wand. Patient can do this just by swiping the one through the head. And this data may be downloaded to a computer. This one can be uploaded to the internet where a physician can remotely basically see the number of seizure, the activity, the uh, lifespan, uh, the battery life, uh, basically the device and everything else. So what it looks like, it looks something like this, basically. So it can be personalized for each individual seizure fingerprint. So by detection, phys physician can identify and program neurostimulator to detect patient-specific electrographic patterns and with the stimulation, Physician can program this device to automatically stimulate in response to specific pattern in the goal of preventing a clinical seizure. So this is how the uh, EEG uh, looks like in this RNS system. 
So you can see the seizure occurs and as the treatment happens, uh, so it just stops before it even happens. So you can record different type of activity, including ictal, meaning seizure activity or intellectual activity or baseline activity. Patient can use the magnet and record the data any, at any time point, basically. So when patient has a seizure, you see this is just an example which lasted more than like 40, 50 seconds or something. Another example where the seizure started and treatment was given and the seizure kind of stopped patient was able to magnet to record the uh, activity. So you can see all sorts of different activity basically uh, in a great um, presentation. So it is a continuous, uh, I mean, it can, sorry. So it can provide continuous kinds of electrographic events or other platform activity or the days, months, and years. So this is just an example of one of our patients with RNS who got the RNS recently. So this is just baseline activity. And after getting RNS, you already start to see some decrease in the seizure number. So uh, you can see the numbers of stimulation for the abnormal brain activity. And interestingly, this patient at this point moved in with a girlfriend. And then after this point, you start to see increase in brain activity. I think that was so funny that like you can see um, the effect of social circumstances in your brain activity, moving in with a girlfriend, I guess, increase your seizure activity. <laughs> so, um, so you can uh, change the pattern detection and you can make it more specific or more sensitive. It can be more specific where you don't want to basically uh, detect any sort of interactive activity as a seizure. And, but in that, you may uh, be a little bit late in, so in terms of the uh, seizure detection. But you can make it even more specific, I mean, sorry, more sensitive by changing the parameters. You may be able to detect the seizures a bit earlier, but in that case, you may end up uh, recording some of the intellectual activity as like false uh, ECAG activity. So it has a great value uh, because it's a chronic ECAG, meaning that it, it records brain activity all the time. So in general, in clinic, uh, when patient doesn't have uh, uh, RNS or anything like this, so patient will come to you and will talk to you about their uh, number of seizures, such as right, they will just give you the verbal report and you will just uh, tailor your management based on the report that they give you. And you don't know whether they are really giving the right report, they may be having some seizure at night that they are not even aware, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have such a device where you uh, basically uh, record the activity all the time, so you have pretty good um, objective understanding of number of seizures. You can uh, see uh, and have an idea about the numbers of in subclinical seizures going on. If patient has two uh, um, RNS electrodes on both sides, you can have uh, some idea about the lateralization, like which side the seizure happens more. And later, maybe patient can be uh, like a surgery ablation uh, or resection uh, uh, candidate. So you can see the medication effects uh, based on looking at the EEG, et cetera, et cetera. And then based on all these uh, objective measures, then you can tailor your management. So now where does the RNS fit into the patient selection? So as Dr. Machinik mentioned, so you have focal and generalized epilepsy. When you have generalized epilepsy, you may offer like ketogenic diet, VNS, et cetera. But if you have a focal, uh, seizure, right? Especially if you have just one focus and you ask yourself all this question, whether it is uh, safe to resect, whether you have low cognitive risk or whether the seizure freedom is likely when you have a seizure focus. If the answer is yes to all this question, then the answer may be uh, resective surgery or ablation. But if any of uh, the answer uh, to any of this question is no, then that's when RNS comes in. So just an example. So if you have a seizure focus that comes from an electron cortex, meaning that if it's arising from an important region of brain, such as like motor region or language region or memory region type of things, then you know that it is not safe to resect. You can lose the important function. So then you do RNS. If a patient has a high risk of cognitive uh, uh, issues, then again, uh, you don't want to do any sort of ablation or resective surgery, you can do RNS. And if the seizure, you know that seizure freedom is not likely and there's no really point to just cut the brain out, et cetera, you can do RNS. So now looking a little bit at those uh, uh, evidence-based uh, data. So they have done uh, this uh, feasibility and pure total trial for patient older than 18 years of age. So where they include a total of 256 patients uh, who had the mean duration of epilepsy of about like 19 years or so. So they have uh, the median number of disabling seizures per month about 10. 
So those who uh, got the RNS, and um, 32% already had the VNS, 34% had uh, uh, some uh, treatment with the surgery, and 35 did not have any sort of intracranial monitoring at all. Uh, looking at the region of the seizure onset in those trials, most of the patient had neocortical seizure onset, meaning that either from lateral temporal, frontal, parietal, or hospital region, and a good, a good majority had also mesotemporal seizures. So when they uh, use RNS for all this patient and they follow them for about like over nine years or something, so um, 73% achieved more than 50% seizure reduction at year nine, but 35% achieved uh, more than 90% seizure reduction in their last six months of follow-up at nine years, and 28% had at least one period of more than six months without seizure. So looking at the seizure freedom period, uh, after three months, 45% seizure free, but over time, so numbers decrease, and after a year or something, so 15% uh, in mesial temporal seizures and 14% in neocortical uh, seizure were uh, uh, basically seizure free. So uh, not only uh, seizure reduction, you have also neuropsychological benefits of RNS. And they look at um, multiple modalities, uh, and they saw statistical significant improvements in naming, verbal learning, visual memory, executive functions. And there was no group decline on any of those patients in neuropsychological measures after blind period uh, or at one and two years. So in another study where they looked at the uh, quality of life improvements, they saw that there was significant, uh, significant basically improvement in several different domains, uh, including like health discouragement, language, memory, energy level, et cetera. So, uh, and one of the things that we always talk about in those uh, patients with refractory epilepsy is CDEP, which is sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patient. In general, it's about nine in, in nine in 1,000 patients. It's almost like one in 100. So when they look at the pseudepase in those who got the RNS, it went down to almost like two in 1,000, which is almost like four or five times difference. And uh, looking at the long-term safety of RNS, so about two to 3% had either some sort of hemorrhage or infection but uh, there was no adverse cognitive effects or no sort of Chronic, uh, chronic stimulation side effects, etc. cetera. So um, I'm done with the RNS. I just wanted to give you also a case uh, presentation. So we have this patient who is 20 years old with intractable focal epilepsy with loss of awareness with occasional secondary generalization uh, in the context of tuberous sclerosis. He had the comorbidity of memory problems since the onset of his seizures, and he was having about five to six seizures per month. So we did an extensive uh, phase one evaluation uh, using all this modality. Majority of the studies were pointing toward the temporal region, left temporal especially. So because he had the multiple tubers and some of those studies were also pointing toward the other sides, we said, okay, let's just uh, place all these electrodes into different part of his head. Majority of them were focused into temporal lobe from uh, like side or with the posterior approach. So a good amount was targeting the uh, uh, temporal lobe. And then because you may have seizure mimickers to temporal lobe seizures, we also wanted to cover some other regions that may create the uh, kind of similar type of seizures. So he had more than 15 different electrodes. And then it turns out that the seizures, were, every time that seizure happens, this electrode, which is PI, which was in one of those tubers in the superior temporal gyri, is having the seizure onset. So then we were like, okay, can we reject this tuber here or can we ablate it? And to understand whether we will have any sort of deficit uh, once we do the resection, we did the brain mapping where we stimulate the brain and to see what type of uh, functions are evolved. And it turned out that he has some language involvement in that region. So that means that we cannot really reject or ablate that tissue because otherwise he's gonna lose his language. So then the answer, uh, for the treatment was RNS. So we placed the RNS and even after like just a few months, he already started to have some seizure uh, and decrease uh, in the numbers. So, um, and that was it. So any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Mashnik and Dr. Karakas. Um, I wanna have, uh, I was just wondering if you can address a couple of questions. I think the first one would be Dr. Karmashnik. Um, What's the data regarding cutaneous, uh, transcutaneous VNS, uh, I, Dr. Machin? 
I would actually have to look that up. I mean, we don't really use transcutaneous VNS um, in any meaningful way. I do know that people are looking at it more and more. Um, it does present certain logistical issues. I mean, do you carry around your, you know, your transcutaneous VNS and, you know, you give yourself a little stim when things are happening. Um, um, but, but I do know that there, there are a number of uh, different applications. I mean, even gastroenterologists are looking at transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulation uh, for certain kind of gut problems. Uh, so I know it's a viable uh, thing. I do not know the specific uh, data regarding its efficacy uh, for what kinds of epilepsy. Marcus, do you want to have any comments on it? No, pretty much the same thing. I'm not much aware of like any sort of data for the transcutaneous for the pediatric patient. I know that there are some talks and you know trials and things like this going on for the adult side, but I'm not much aware for the kids. Yeah, I think what I know is just uh, I think it's been approved in Europe uh, for epilepsy in adults, and uh, I just wanted to get the thoughts. Okay, and a neuromodulation. Uh, I, I know we discussed the VNS and uh, the RNS. Any thoughts regarding transcutaneous magnetic stimulation, Dr. Caracas? Yeah, that's a great question. So definitely TMS can be used in uh, several different conditions, including like headache, epilepsy, and uh, some, I think, depressive conditions. So again, I don't think there is much really data for uh, using the TMS in pediatric epilepsy, especially because it's not really FDA approved. So we are even having sometimes difficulty to get approval uh, to do even like TMS for um, kind of uh, functional mapping, et cetera. So, um, but I'm not really aware of any sort of specifics for the epilepsy. Um, and the other question would be, just, just to clarify, you mentioned that uh, the brain waves are activated or recorded in the RNS all the time, or is it just a, you know, short <laughs> epochs are, are are recorded in the RNS machine? Sure. So there are three different recording actually uh, measures. So either magnet, whenever you use magnet, the device will record the activity for a total of like 90 seconds or something. So then uh, whenever the activity saturates, meaning that you set some parameters and you tell the device, okay, so once you see the type of activity that I'm asking for, then just like uh, uh, record the data. And in a day, you are able to just record up to a total of uh, 720 seconds of uh, basically data you can do more than that. So it all also depends on like uh, downloading the data. So it, usually with this device, people would just download the data once in a day or something like this. But if you keep downloading the data, and then of course you can keep uh, recording the data, but then it will uh, kind of waste a lot of energy and things like this. So you will run out of the battery much easily if you keep doing this. So better to just do it once a day and record about 720 seconds in a day or so. Good, okay, thank you. Uh, the other thing, are there any specific contraindication for RNS placement? Um, specific contraindication, well, I mean, not exactly aware of any sort of specifics, but in terms of like logistic and, you know, the indication wise, right? So if of course you have um, focal epilepsy, right? Then you can do RNS. Uh, if you have generalized epilepsy, you don't have a focus. There are some only case reports where you can do it for just, you know, the talons or some ways. Um, otherwise, I, I mean, I'm just trying to think of, you know, what other, contraindication you you may have um I, I can't think of at this moment i mean any sort of specifics i'm not sure if you are aware and uh dr dr taylor burr uh, he's asking a question is there a possibility for a patient to make adjustment uh to the rns just like they do with the dbs there is, you know, so uh, once we start um, detection parameters, so you just uh, activate the stimulation for a month or something like this. You don't do any stimulation at all. And then as you record several uh, seizures and you have a good understanding of, you know, how the seizure looks like in the RNS, then you tweak your de device uh, based on the specifics. You can make it more specific, more sensitive. And every time patient comes into you, you keep changing your uh, uh, parameters and the recommendation is to make like some changes every three months or so. So to get to maximum dose of like current stimulation and things like this, it almost takes about like 
seven to eight uh, clinic visit, which is almost like two years or so. So which is why, you know, when they did all these clinical trials and everything, so they start to see kind of benefit after two or three years or something, because it takes some time to just even reach the maximum uh, settings. We have one more minute. Uh, I would utilize that to uh, ask a question to Dr. Mashnik. Dr. Mashnik, with the new surgical technique that you mentioned, um, that you uh, the the paper from the Israel that you quoted. What's your clinical experience? Is it very similar, uh, or from the side effect perspective? I mean, from a surgical perspective, it is no more difficult, right? You just have to learn the new anatomy and wrap the electrodes and that's the same. Um, from a side effect perspective, I'm just the wrong guy to ask. I put these in, I make sure that the incisions look good. Uh, and then um, and then it's you guys that get to see what the side effects are at different levels of stimulation um, and at different adjustments. So I, I, I actually don't know, um, you know, I'm certainly encouraged by the data that they reported in 2017. Um, but I, I would rely on you guys to say, you know, wow, this is, you know, keep doing this super clavicular thing, um, you know, because I, I don't get that kind of feedback. Okay, we'll definitely look into it. And uh, thank you. I want to thank you both Dr. Marchnik and Dr. Karakas for a uh, question giving this that awesome. I guess I can answer, uh, Pradeep. So the question is, does the RNS uh, lose efficacy over time due to scarring or neuroplasticity? You know, based on just looking at this data, I can say that over time, it seems like if anything, the efficacy was increasing rather than actually decreasing. So over like seven, eight years or something, efficacy went from like, you know, 50, 60% up to like 75% or so. So I would say there may be actually increasing efficacy rather than decreasing. Which is kind of a hallmark of neuromodulation for epilepsy. Yeah. Okay, guys, thank you. Uh, we are running out of time. I want to thank you once again. We will move on to the next talk.